mentioning that this webinar is co-sponsored and it's being organized in the context of a partnership between the Institute for Palestine Studies and uh, the organization Against Apartheid and Racial Discrimination, uh, RD. This partnership uh, between our two organizations has various dimensions, including events such as this webinar, but also uh, more importantly, we're launching an online portal that will document Israeli discriminatory and apartheid practices with an integrated database on Israeli apartheid, as well as in-depth academic studies and policy briefs on the subject. We are fortunate today to have three very insightful and inspiring thinkers on the question of Palestine and the Palestinian cause, Professors Ilan Pape, Virginia Tilly, and Raif Zreik. All three have made seminal contributions to our understanding of the history of the struggle, as well as its present realities and future directions. I won't try to introduce the speakers in detail. Their biographies were circulated in the announcement for the webinar, uh, which I'm sure uh, most of you saw and you can look them all up and, and find their work online. Now, the format for this webinar will be as follows. I'm going to try to introduce the topic and make some preliminary remarks about its significance. I'll just take a few minutes to do that. And then I'll ask each of our speakers to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, after which we should have about uh, 30 minutes for questions and answers. Now, you can type your questions uh, in the chat using the uh, chat function in Zoom. Um, you can also submit them on Facebook. Uh, please try to keep the questions brief so that we can distill them. I'm going to try and summarize them with the help of my colleague uh, at IPS, Laura Albust, and pose them to our panelists. By way of setting the stage, I just wanted to say a few words about the A word, the apartheid word, which for a long time was considered taboo in this context, but has become increasingly prevalent, though among apologists for Israel, it's used more often, I would say, with a negation sign in front of it. As in, I'm not saying that Israel is an apartheid state, but it will become one in X years, where of course the X is always sometime in the future. Former Israeli prime ministers have made statements to this effect, as well as numerous Western political figures and pundits. But no one ever seems to call them on it later to say, Look, X years ago, you said that Israel would become an apartheid state. So what's your position now, now that those years have, have elapsed? So I wanted to start by saying that I think when we're talking about the concept of apartheid and its applicability to Israel-Palestine, we could be talking about two different things. On the one hand, there's the historical reality of apartheid as manifested in South Africa until the early 1990s. That's a specific political regime at a particular period in history which is thankfully no longer with us. But on the other hand, there's the legal definition of apartheid as found in international law and as later confirmed by numerous human rights groups and legal experts. So by way of introducing the topic, I'm going to try to say a few words about each of those uh, two things. When it comes to the historical apartheid in South Africa, there's been some very interesting research and analysis on the ways in which the historical analogy does and also does not apply to the case of Israel. Of course, no analogy is perfect and no two historical cases are identical. But I think it's also true to say that imperfect analogies sometimes allow us to pinpoint important features of each situation that we might otherwise have overlooked. Certainly many of those who led the struggle against apartheid in South Africa saw the parallels and thought that they were significant and revealing. After Nelson Mandela was released from prison, one of the things that he was most challenged on, or indeed I would say harassed about, was the ANC's relationship to the PLO, the relationship of the African National Congress and the whole struggle against uh, apartheid in South Africa to the Palestinian struggle. And in response, he made this interesting statement in March 1990, just over 31 years ago. He said, I quote, we expect everybody who is exploring the possibility of lasting solutions to be able to face the truth squarely. I sincerely believe that there are many similarities between our struggle and that of the PLO. We live under a unique form of colonialism in South Africa, as well as in Israel, and a lot flows from that, end of quote. Now, what's particularly interesting to me about that statement is its paradoxical nature. Mandela calls it a unique form of colonialism but he also thinks that it applies to both South Africa and Israel. 
So it's a framework that comprises the two regimes and unites them in a kind of exceptional state of injustice. Another thing that I think Mandela's statement brings out is that there's no necessary tension or contradiction between apartheid and settler colonialism. He calls it a unique form of colonialism, or for that matter, between apartheid and military occupation. To say that it's a case of apartheid does not preclude that it's also a case of settler colonialism or of military occupation. So, so much for the historical phenomenon of apartheid. When it comes to the legal definition, according to the International Criminal Court, apartheid is defined as, quote, an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. And according to the United Nations definition, apartheid similarly consists of, quote, inhuman acts committed for the purpose of, of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. Now, numerous experts in international law and international commissions have confirmed that as defined in international law, what we have in Israel today is apartheid, pure and simple. I think it's worth mentioning, just to get them on the table, three landmark reports or findings uh, of this type. In 2007, the Human Sciences Research Council, HSRC of South Africa, commissioned a report that concluded that Israel's military occupation, quote, has become a colonial enterprise which implements a system of apartheid, end of quote. And the lead author of that report is one of our panelists today, Professor Tilly. Then in 2017, a decade later, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, ESQA, issued a report that affirmed that Israel maintains an apartheid regime against Palestinians with, quote, an array of laws, policies, and practices, end of quote. And then more recently, in January of this year, the Israeli human rights organization, B'Tselem, also issued a very well-documented report confirming that there exists, quote, a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. And notice, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. So they're not just talking about the occupied territories. And, and the B'Tselem report is interesting because it says our initial mandate was to uh, write reports and document what was going on in the occupied territories. But, uh, you know, with the, with the force of events, with developments, we found that we have to really look at the whole territory, at the whole area between the river and the sea. This report, by the way, the Batsalem report has, has yet to be mentioned by the New York Times and, and most of the mainstream media in the United States, uh, which, which is slightly surprising given that the, the Times seems to publish an article every time a new restaurant opens in Tel Aviv. So it's a bit of an anomaly that this report has not yet been mentioned. So given this background and the preponderance of expert opinion, the issue it seems is not whether Israel is an apartheid state, but where do we go from here? How should this finding inform action on Palestine and our thinking about how to move forward? What does the apartheid paradigm entail when it comes to the effort to dismantle the regime in Israel and to liberate the people of Palestine? How does that affect how we organize politically or the political goals that we set ourselves or our vision for the future? So with that in mind, uh, this webinar was, was organized to try and address some of these questions. And I'm now gonna hand it over to our panelists uh, starting with uh, Professor uh, Pape. Um, I think I've said enough by way of introduction and um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Professor Khalidi. And uh, it's great honor to be with Raif in Virginia uh, and with you in the same panel. And I want to thank uh, the Institute uh, and the other uh, organizing uh, committee for uh, inviting me. Uh, I would like uh, to address the uh, popular interpretations of the concept of Israel as an apartheid state and stress that they may differ a bit from a proper academic comparative analysis which highlights the similarities as well as the dissimilarities between the two case studies and also not to focus on the legal aspects and implications of applying the term to the Israeli regime over the whole of historical Palestine. I'm sure I arrive in Virginia can do it much better than I do. I do it not because I think these two inquiries, uh, the academic one and the legal one, 
are not significant or important. On the contrary, they're very important and are an ongoing project and will contribute further for exploring uh, the implications of uh, the scholarly and legal validity of the application of the term to Israel. What I offer is just another dimension uh, for the discussion, which I hope is worthy of our attention. Uh, looking at the popular interpretations uh, of this application, not necessarily on the academic and legal one, is interesting also from a more theoretical point of view, but of course I'm not going to dwell on it now. I would just mention that it opens a new area of inquiry in social movement theories of the different usages of concepts that might be clearly articulated uh, legally or theoretically by professionals on the one hand, and yet emerge with a different bottom-up interpretation uh, chosen by activists of the social movement. The activists uh, usually cast a new content into the definitions, into the academic and legal definitions, and uh, these definitions can have a life of their own sometimes. And maybe in terms of political impact, and effectiveness, sometimes these popular definitions bear more significant fruits than the legal deliberation or the academic uh, discussion. Referring to Israel as an apartheid state is one such example when people who did not delve into the profound legal or academic discussion of the term decided to use it based on uh, intuition, uh, faith, basic knowledge, and various degrees of independent quest, but not a professional one, uh, to know something about apartheid in general or apartheid in South Africa in particular. But it's very clear that at a given moment, these popular bottom-up interpretations inspired a certain kind of activity that when it transpired as having a galvanizing force, the popular interpretation gathered a momentum of its own and was more commonly used. And this continued even in the face of some academic criticism that the terms are not entirely, uh, that the term is not entirely applicable or that engaging with it legally is quite complex and requires a higher degree of qualification, which is absolutely true. It is interesting to follow the evolvement uh, and the development of this spontaneous, instinctive usage of apartheid or of Israel as an apartheid state and ask why was it so effective? And it was effective. And maybe ponder a bit about its future usages and possible development. It should be noted that activists in the solidarity movement with the Palestinian struggle, and of course, Palestinian scholars and, and uh, politicians use this term many, many years ago definitely in the early work of our host uh, institute, the Institute for Palestine Studies, and in the work of the PLO Research Center in Beirut that uh, was established in, uh, in 1964, and in the works of people who were affiliated with these two uh, institutions. At the time, reference to apartheid appeared not only a term in academic work, but also in the political discourse or the anti-colonialist discourse of the Palestinian national movement that had its own impact, for instance, on the debate of the in United Nations in the 1970s and influenced resolutions adopted in the General Assembly, uh, culminating in the equation of Zionism uh, with racism in 1975. It was part of the Palestinian discourse uh, and the discourse of a relatively small number of people in the West who were supporting the Palestinian struggle, mainly on the left. Nowadays, it is used much more widely and more popular. It became popular uh, in response to the BDS call, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction call, which itself was inspired by the struggle against apartheid uh, in South Africa. And therefore, the young people who were the first to stage the first Israel apartheid week in a Canadian university in 2005, were part of that initiative to try and galvanize a particularly young public opinion at the time. I'm sorry, to galvanize a particularly young public opinion 
uh, at a time when it was clear that there was political fragmentation in Palestinian politics, and also at a time when the Israeli brutality towards the Palestinians in the occupied territories uh, reached new uh, levels of inhumanity. It proved a very effective way of organizing and regulating political life uh, in campuses around the Palestine issue, in particularly in American and North American campuses, and later also in British and some European campuses, uh, that used to be bastions of uh, the Israeli Hasbara or propaganda, uh, and now became danger zones or no-go area for quite a few but, uh, Israeli diplomats. Its success does not derive from the validity of the comparison of apartheid South Africa to Israel. It is a valid comparison, but this is not the reason why the concept of an Israeli apartheid group, for instance, or the common usage of, of the re or common reference to Israel as an apartheid state uh, uh, is, is uh, spreading around so quickly. Uh, it, this kind of achievement comes from the ability of the popular interpretation to provide a focus on a reality that otherwise can be fragmented by Palestinian geography or, or Palestinian political factionalism, by different Palestinian ideological interpretation of the Palestinian struggle uh, in the past and the, the, the debate about the, the future. It clarifies the nature of the beast that you want in a way that first gives you a clear vocabulary to describe the reality on the ground itself in an incisive way. And it clarifies, and this is the most important part, I think, of the reference to apartheid in the popular sense. It clarifies the role of the solidarity movement outside of Palestine, even when there is no direct adverse or orientation coming from the Palestinian leadership, whatever the Palestinian leadership today means. There is no ANC, there's no equivalent to what the ANC was uh, for the uh, anti-apartheid solidarity movement today uh, in the case of the pro-Palestinian solidarity movement. It even helps, I think, to bridge over the debate between one status and two status. It all becomes a bit irrelevant from this perspective if the solidarity movement believes uh, that its role is not to advocate the definition of the liberation, the Palestinian liberation project in, in this century, but rather to learn from the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, how to define clearly uh, what solidarity means and what can it do and what it cannot do. Using similar language and methods of that solidarity movement in the case of South Africa, inspired to, and being as inspired by its determination, not only as being in opposition to the apartheid state of Israel, but with a clear target which is outside the internal Palestinian debate, and can only be an internal Palestinian debate, what, what should be the liberation of, what the liberation of Palestine means in the 21st century. This is the strength of the popular interpretation. It provides uh, a tangible, a tangible, uh, uh, meaningful target that could be achieved gradually. And that target is making uh, uh, Israel a, a pariah state. So the popular usage of the term apartheid and its dissemination through events like the Israel Apartheid Week in campuses helps to define this interim tangible target, which is very important for a solidarity movement. And, and I repeat, the target is in every means possible to turn Israel into a pariah state. This can be achieved either by sound bites, such as the Israeli apartheid uh, week, or by a detailed unpacking of the sound bite into description of the daily abuses of civil and human rights, or more accumulative reports, annual ones, monthly ones, or decade ones, of the effect of these violations over time. Finally, looking into the future, the popular reference to apartheid as a galvanizing magnet and a compass towards a tangible target, target that you can progress towards it gradually has already proven to be effective as can be seen from the reaction to it. A whole establishment in the West counters it with legislation, intimidation, bribery, 
And there is a special ministry in Israel, the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, that is established to fight it and other terms that seem to, in their eyes, to delegitimize the state of Israel. Even if the campaign that they are targeting is run by a group of students and not by a regional or superpower, a regional power or a superpower. It means that it erodes this kind of popular interpretation and its galvanizing force, erodes one of the two pillars on which Israel rests, the moral one, the other one is the material one. It will not be enough, of course, to end the colonization and the occupation, but it is effective in influencing certain sections, even within the Jewish society in Israel, and has already changed the discourse of some of its more conscientious members, as was as happened with the Bethlehem report that Professor Khaledi uh, has mentioned. The change is not going far enough, even with the Bethlehem report. But with the willingness of the Jews inside and outside Israel, some Jews inside and outside Israel, to use freely the term for describing the state as a, an apartheid, or to use the term apartheid for describing the state, means that Israel might lose that section in the society that provides it with a charade of being the only democracy in the Middle East. The spread of the term and other terms such as settler colonialism, ethnic cleansing, and even genocide uh, into mainstream media, academia, and, and politics seems to be unstoppable. The language has changes and language is important. Um, obviously, uh, more discreet processes uh, will have to take place within the Palestinian liberation movement itself, in the region, in the attitude of the Muslim and non-Western world, in the development of a more democratic West to change the reality on the ground. But this particular development will play an important role in the struggle uh, for the liberation and justice in Palestine. So whether it is uh, a popular and sometimes not totally professional, it is widely used and I think 10 years after, 15 years, actually 16 years after it was reinvented as an important term, especially in student activity, but in civil society activity as a whole, one can see the impact and one should really hope it will continue uh, alongside, of course, the legal struggle and the uh, political struggle and the academic uh, inquiry into how to make it work more effective. Thank you. Hey, th thank you very much, Ilan. Lots of provocative ideas there that I hope we'll have a chance to follow up on uh, in the discussion. Uh, and uh, we should now uh, hear from uh, Professor Tilly. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, I, I really appreciated listening to Ilan's uh, ideas here, uh, it took me back to the uh, origins of my own work in this area, which was indeed that um, many people were talking in the 1990s and 2000s about Israel being an apartheid state and uh, denounced apartheid wall, uh, anti-apartheid week in the, in the activist circles and so forth. And that um, uh, it was what in fact triggered me to go into this as an academic question, as a theoretical question. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd like to try to put those two things together a little bit, the, the, uh, the, the popular movement and the um, intellectual or, or theoretical project. Um, not sure I'll succeed in that, but let me give, me, give it a try. Uh, one thing I think is very clear at this point is that um, it is time to face facts and, and move on. O Oslo Accords were a, were a terrible error. Uh, they were doomed from the start. Um, the situation, uh, the, the reality they created has been plain since Edward Said called that situation in 1998 um, uh, in an article called The One State Solution that he wrote um, then. Uh, that's a long time ago now. Um, I wrote a book in 2005 that spelled out why a two-state solution is, it can't possibly work. Um, but that work led me to uh, ask myself, do I really know what's going on here? Do I, what about the word apartheid? Does this word really apply? Um, are we just using it heuristically or, or suggestively? 
uh, to highlight um, questions of race and racial discrimination, or is this really an apartheid regime? And of course, Israel was rejecting the idea that it was an apartheid regime with, with considerable liveliness. So it really did seem that we should um, anchor it somehow. Uh, and that led to my own work with uh, international lawyers in this field. I'm a political scientist, so it required uh, working uh, with a team. Um, that, uh, regarding the legal question of apartheid, I, I kind of agree with the Ilan that it's time to move on though. Um, we established in the uh, Human Sciences Research Council report, which I was not, by the way, the lead author on, but the lead, uh, the project leader and a co-author on. Uh, the main authors were international lawyers. Um, that report came out in 2009. And um, later the um, UN, uh, that, that experience of leading that report led me to um, work with Richard Falk on the United Nations ESCO report uh, that came out in 2017. Since those reports came out, um, the first one, HSRC report being published with Pluto Press in 2012, um, to a notable lack of fanfare, um, but those reports, no one has ever made any legal argument against them. The, the findings have stood the test of time. Uh, Israel hasn't presented any rational argument against them. Um, no one has, I think they, it's, it's, the evidence is overwhelming uh, that Israel is practicing apartheid. Uh, I hope that the ICC will address this question, but um, I consider it settled uh, myself. Um, and I, frankly, I wanna move on uh, and move back into my own field, which is political science and nationalism and racial relations. Um, so the question I think now is not whether this is apartheid, but what this signifies for a stable solution in, uh, in the country. Um, and and I, I want to talk about that being one country, uh, which is a paradigm shift. Um, Raif uh, Zreik, uh, who's with us today, happily, um, talked about recently in a, in a major talk about the power of political imagination, uh, and particularly regarding the Green Line, uh, how we, people understand the Green Line and what's beyond it. Um, from the Israeli point of view, uh, I would like to contest the question of the Green Line from the Palestinian point of view and the international human rights point of view. Uh, my own present book project is about reimagining Palestine in ways reflecting the apartheid paradigm. So um, I suggest it is time for a holistic shift in how we are talking about the conflict. Um, Ian Lustig wrote a book, very good book on this, by the way, Paradigm Lost, highly, highly recommended. But I think the challenge uh, that he identified goes further. Um, one suggestion that I have at this point is that we focus on the centennial, the centennial of Mandate Palestine when it was established in 1922, 100 years ago next year, when Palestine uh, was established as a non-sectarian nation state by the League of Nations. Um, it's time to consider what this means. Uh, and I think it, after all we've seen over the last few decades, it suggests a need to return to that model. It was the only model that ever made sense, such a, in the sense that any of the Sykes-Picot states at the time made sense, uh, which of course they were a, a brutalization of the society on the ground. But in any case, now we have Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, um, and Iraq, and the, we have a geography of Mandate Palestine, which remains to this day. The entire conflict plays out in the same geography. Um, and it has never been successfully partitioned ever. And it isn't partitioned now, it's functioning as one state. So I think it's time to go back to 1922 and pick up the normative um, qualities of the mandate state, which was a non-sectarian state for all its people. Uh, this involves uh, a bunch of work, okay? Uh, several frameworks must be altered. Um, involving a reimagining of the problem on every level. Um, one of them is uh, international law. I think that work has been now um, satisfactorily done. We can, uh, hopefully lawyers will continue to work on that, but uh, it also includes ideology. Um, it requires ideological shifts, which are very challenging. Um, but I think one thing that's come out of this work is that uh, very prominently has come out of the work on apartheid is that when we consider the Palestine problem in historical perspective, um, going back to 1922, it's clear that the problem 
of Palestine, the question of Palestine, the Palestine problem is not occupation. Um, the problem existed before the occupation as expressed in the Nakba in 1948. It's the Nakba that should guide us here. The expulsion of the Palestinian people from, from the, most of Palestine. Uh, not the status quo that emerged from the Nakba, which is Israel being recognized as a legitimate state, despite the absence of any formal treaty to this effect in 72% of mandate Palestine. Um, there's a point here that I, I, I've gotten quite interested in, uh, perhaps others are better qualified than I am to, to probe it, but so kind of a legal question. I mean, people presuppose the legitimacy of Israel within the 1949 ceasefire lines. Um, international lawyers do, diplomats do, Israel's a state on the international stage, and but it has no borders, okay? It's just the internationally recognized borders, but they've never been confirmed by treaty. This view of Israel as an existing state with all the rights and, and privileges that come with that status suggests um, that a solution, quote unquote, to the Palestine problem is to be achieved through Israel's withdrawal from foreign territory it's holding under occupation, which is the West Bank and Gaza Strip and including East Jerusalem. This is, I think is just wrong. Um, the real problem is that in fact, no formal partition of Mandate Palestine has ever been effective. Certainly not in Israel's view. Not least because this was always impossible. Uh, forget the Peel Commission, I'll, I'll come back to that in, in, in a bit, but the, it was logistically impossible to divide this small country into ethnic nation states. It, it couldn't happen under the British and it hasn't, didn't happen in the 48 and the 47 UN uh, project and it hasn't happened to this day. Um, and so this is the, the key reimagining point, I think, that the Palestine problem is not military occupation. It's an unresolved civil war between Mandate Palestine that is still playing out. Um, this, um, there's several implications here for rethinking uh, the problem. One is um, probably the most challenging for a lot of people in the movement, um, which is to face under these conditions, the absolute inadmissibility of Jewish statehood, not because it's Jewish, but because ethnic statehood is impossible any place without, it automatically imposes discrimination and human rights violations. Um, on Israel's model of what they mean by Jewish statehood, it's not just a nominal name. It's not just, a, it's not equivalent to saying that Egypt is a Muslim state or something like that. It's, it frames all law and privileges and, and citizenship status in the country. And in this model, Jewish statehood fits the definition of apartheid in the convention, the International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, which means that Jewish statehood in this model not Jewish homeland or something, but Jew, actually Jewish state contradicts international human rights laws and norms that we hold everywhere else, that people defend and, and stamp our feet about rightly, I think, uh, everywhere else, uh, which is not to create a state that is biased against a, a particular racial group or because you don't belong to the right ethnic group. Um, if we see Jewish statehood as inadmissible, not because it's Jewish, but because it's ethnic, that means that it's inadmissible to seek a Palestinian state in order to accommodate Jewish statehood. Partition was always an expression of Zionism. It was always designed to preserve Israel as a Jewish state inside the Israel's borders, wherever those were to be determined. And it remains unworkable as it was from the beginning. And I think it is inadmissible. Um, one of the things that is a challenge that's come out of the, of the recent work, and I think it's, it's vital, is to recognize how Israel, how Israeli apartheid, Israel's apartheid regime uses these domains. Uh, it has fragmented the problem into um, these different compartments, uh, which are geographic, ideological, political, and social fragmentation uh, that's integral to Israel's control over the Palestinian people and its domination of the Palestinian people in order to secure Jewish statehood. This is the, dom the, the 
geographic, ideological, legal fragmentation of creating a separate category for Israeli citizens of Israel, Palestinians under occupation, Palestinians in, in Jerusalem, uh, as, who have resident status, and the refugees. Uh, this now, these four categories are now treated as four different problems. And I think the, the insight into thinking about this as a case of apartheid is we see that it is in fact one problem, that these domains are all designed to work in complementary fashion to secure Jewish domination of the state. Um, this means uh, on, a, on the ground, some pretty tough lessons for people like uh, for Palestinian citizens, it signals the impossibility of ever gaining equal rights there. Um, the Palestinian citizens of Israel are acceptable only so long as their presence is politically innocuous, politically inoffensive to the minor, they're too much safe minority, can never change the laws of the state. Once that begins to, once Palestinian citizens begin to challenge the laws of the state, instantly we see Israel reacting nation state law is an example of this new basic law to, to crush, uh, forestall any, any significant advance in, in that direction. And I think that will become more graphic as time goes on because the Palestinian citizens are now a very lively uh, population in every level, uh, popular level, academic level. So that's gonna get worse, I think. Um, we have to accept the, and I, I think it's just unacceptable to talk about partition uh, involving Israel's giving up the West Bank. I mean, that, that is just, I've been working on that since the 1980s, and it just is overwhelmingly clear that Israel is never going to withdraw from the West Bank. It has far too much importance to Israel in, in several different ways. Um, and it will not be reversed. So that's, we just have to give that up. I think all talk of a two-state solution resting on that is therefore just specious. It's, it's a chimera, it's, it's a, and I think it's really a lie. Um, but given these things, given the idea that, that the, Israel will not withdraw, this means that Palestinian nationalism I say this is an outsider, obviously, but I'm just looking at this situation as a case on the planet. It's clear that Palestinian nationalism requires a quantum, quantum jump here. Um, it's very difficult to do, but it's the same challenge that the people in South Africa faced, which was uh, the challenge of settler colonialism. You, you have to find a way to create a democratic society with a large settled indigenized settler population that is not going to leave, at least most of them are. The South Africans called this colonialism of a special type. Palestinians uh, have been calling it settler colonialism, but there has been a shortage of ideological work done to adjust the idea of Palestinian self-determination to a, um, a settler colonial uh, solution. What, what do you do when you have to accommodate roughly 50-50 population in, in a, one territory? Um, I do think uh, the, the, the answer was to be a, you know, a, a partition and a, um, through the Oslo Accords. Uh, I think that we now can very clearly see that as a Bantustan plan. And the, here the, the apartheid analysis really became very helpful to me because it clarified how the PA is really almost identical in its institutional design uh, to the South African Bantustans, which is not really surprising because Israel and South Africa were very close allies during the apartheid period. And I think Israel took a lot of ideas from them uh, as well as learning from South Africa's mistakes. Um, but I think one of the things that is helpful from the Bantustan uh, perspective is to explain why the Palestinian Authority takes the positions it takes, emphasizing two states, emphasizing uh, the rights of the state of Palestine, trying to get recognition of the state of Palestine, um, how and, and how those, that agenda must be interpreted. I mean, these people are true believers. They really believe in this. I, I, perhaps they are cynical, but I think they really believe it. 
but they have big interests to defend here. Any Bantustan government does. Um, that's why uh, South Africa set up Bantustan governments and installed leaderships uh, because they knew that the leaderships would have enormous vested interests in keeping these things going. Um, but in, in Palestine, they, I think Israel learned the mistakes of that by working with Arafat to bring Arafat and, and Fatah back in to, to do this. So it gave them a lot more loss of legitimacy. Um, but seeking self-determination in a Bantustan state is just can only reproduce inequality and vulnerability. This was very clearly seen in the South African case. And um, the palace PA is now prone to see this is the best they can get. So they're saying, well, if this is the best we can get, why do you want us to give it up and, and go for this, this illusion of one state, which will never happen? I think it's the other way around. Uh, I think the Bantustan state is the trap. Uh, the Bantustan lens also helps us understand the PA elections and everything to do with the PA as reifying those domains, um, which is instrumental for apartheid. The more the, the PA government is separated from Palestinian citizens of Israel and from the Jerusalem and from the refugees, the better the system works. Israel is absolved of responsibility for these people and it gets moved off into the, onto the PA, and then they are to blame for anything that goes wrong. Same thing in South Africa. Um, I, I'm going to skip ahead because I'm afraid I'm going a little long, uh, but I, I just wanted to um, make the point here that um, if we assume that the Oslo Accords were, from Israel's perspective, always aiming for a Bantustan state, and I think there's a lot of evidence for this, when we look at how the Oslo Accords were, were designed. It, it starts to become, especially for, I think for older veterans of the conflict who've been around since before the Oslo period, that you know, before that period, Palestinians were, were well, the formal position was to reclaim all of Palestine and uh, that was given up. But I think we must return now to the mandate state as established by the League of Nations in 1922 and start seeing this differently, seeing it as an unresolved civil war for control of that state, for control of the mandate state. Um, I think just linguistically, just talking rhetorically, sorry, talking about just mandate Palestine all the time will help to, to encourage this, this vision. I want to uh, touch briefly on a question of power here because this has arisen uh, a lot lately. Um, one of the things that has, has come up in, in talking about shifting to a really, you know, Palestine uh, apartheid paradigm, which in, in my analysis really means giving up this Bantustan state, which I think is a terrible trap, uh, and going for unification. Um, some people are saying, well, now hang on. Uh, we can't do that until America agrees and Europe agrees and it becomes officially recognized as kind of, some people call this the America first approach. Um, I think this is just insupportable. I don't understand this argument, especially from people who are familiar with the South African case. Um, the United States was the last country on the planet to reject apartheid in South Africa. It was still holding on to it when the whole country was falling apart, when South Africa was falling apart. If the movement for, against apartheid had waited for US action, we'd have apartheid in South Africa to this day. Um, the real force in that transition came from the ANC's claim to international human rights law and the moral onus of, of responding to this terrible, uh, cruel regime. Um, and by comparison, I just want to point out that the claim to ethno-nationalism, you know, a Jewish state, Palestinian state, Palestinian Arab state in an ethnic sense is a far weaker claim on the international stage both politically and morally and legally for that matter, than a demand for non-racial rule and full equality on the South Africa model. Uh, I sometimes illustrate this by saying, suggesting that if the South African problem had been seen as a problem of Zulu self-determination, I think we'd have apartheid there to this day. Um, it wasn't that you know, Zulu self-determination that seized the global imagination. It was the rejection of racism, which is a global value. And in this sense, I think the anti-apartheid movement inherits uh, in, in applying to Israel a whole gamut of norms and rights and experience that is far more powerful uh, politically. And this um, suggests that it is in fact the Palestinians who have all the power right now. 
um, once they shift and make take this stance, as Ehud Olmert famously said, Israel is finished. That's what Olmert said, minister of the country. Palestinians have all the power, but they they to to change the entire discourse by demanding equality in mandate Palestine, one country. Um, but they need a new nationalist discussion in order to do that. I think that's very clear. Uh, the Institute for Palestine Studies, I think, has a, a crucial role here, potentially. Um, the Center for Palestine Studies at SOAS, uh, Exeter, of course, um, was prime turf for this, this, these discussions. Um, but what it really needs is an internal debate within the Palestinian national community. People like Rashid Khalidi, Ali Abu Nima, also, you know, fellow travelers like Haim Rashid, Ian, Ian Lustig, many others have opened these questions. There's no reason why that shouldn't be a, a solidarity discussion. Um, I would just urge that this happen fast. It's way overdue. Um, the situation in Gaza is reaching a terrible state. Uh, and we are approaching a point where people are talking about a third intifada. If we get a third intifada, without a clear workable principled ideology to overarch and pull together the aims and goals of, the, of such, a, such an effort, we are looking at a very dangerous situation. And uh, this kind of haunts my dreams. So um, I'm hoping that, that will uh, this and, and other events, perhaps the centennial next year would be the time to undertake this with the seriousness I think it deserves. Uh, I hope I didn't go too long there. Thank you, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Now I'm going to hand it over to our third speaker, Professor Raif Zareq. Yes, thank you all. I'm really glad to be on this panel as well uh, with people that I learned from their work tremendously. And Elan, speaking of that uh, event, I think it even was in 2003 in Ann Arbor. Um, I was there, probably you were there as well, uh, the first anti-apartheid uh, week. Um, and from there probably came my first article on the apartheid, uh, Palestine apartheid and the right uh, discourse. Now, um, I'll take the position more of, uh, political theorist, but political activist as well. So I'll start from uh, more from reality, let's say, um, from where we are and see from here where we can go and why the anti-apartheid movement is um, not in the horizon, I'm afraid. On the one hand, I see that it's becoming clear necessity. On the other hand, it's not on the horizon. And I want to put um, several factors why I think it's not on the horizon and see how we can deal with them. How can we overcome them? How can we? Now speaking about um, the power of the metaphor, even if it's not articulated in academic way, I agree completely with, uh, with Elon. Uh, sometimes you don't have to be that neat in order uh, to master solidarity with uh, Palestine. You don't have really to take the measures one by one. If a certain metaphor grips the people's imagination um, and, and helps to carry solidarity, that's excellent. Um, but I'm trying to think from Palestine, from Palestine and from Israel as a political activist who's trying to start such a movement, an anti-apartheid movement. And here there is a difference between solidarity movement across the universe in Europe or in the US or in Africa and the question of strategy. Now to use apartheid as a heuristic way to gather sympathy, solidarity for Palestinians around the world is one thing. But to use the metaphor in order to build a political program for Palestinians need more clarity. It can't be only heuristic. 
it needs to be articulated. It needs to have its clear program and vision for the future. And in this regard, there is a difference what we can expect from solidarity and what we can expect from those who are on the ground, uh, from the Palestinian national movement, what they can suggest, what ideas they can bring to the table. And this is the something that I want to pursue, the problems of establishing anti-apartheid movement, which pretty much Virginia have already alluded to some of them. Um, and as a matter of fact, I did want to reproduce my talk in Sawas. So that's why um, I, I want to, uh, uh, to develop some new ideas uh, today. But, but one thing that is clear that there's a reality of separation has been going all the time in Palestine, but the grip of apartheid is not taking off despite all what we talk now here as an academic, as intellectuals, etc., we have two elections going on, three audiences. We having election in the West Bank. We having election in Israel where Palestinians participate in this election and Jews participate in this election. Palestinians in Israel don't speak about apartheid. Not even they don't speak about apartheid. They don't even speak about the recent nationality law that actually not only put them as a second class citizen, even doesn't mention them. They they're even now uh, want to appease the state. They are lowering their demands even. Of course, the Jews are not speaking. Nobody on the right or the left speaking about apartheid. Nobody speaking about the Palestinian question Anyway, it's just evaporated the Palestinian question. And there are elections taking uh, place in the Palestinian territories. And there is a debate if Barghouti would uh, be candidate or not. So the current political imagination and reality of the practitioners, of the politicians, is still not one of apartheid. There is a reality of separation, but not every separation creates apartheid. There is no reality of conceiving that we are one unity. We are one frame. This is still not really grasped. It doesn't become a political power that someone wake up in Jenin and thinks, oh, I want to have a movement that would be participants in it. Me in Jenin, Palestinians in Nazareth, and Jews in Tel Aviv. It, it doesn't occur even to people, not people in Jenin, nor people in Tel Aviv. It still is not there. Let's face this fact. Now, how can we build an anti-apartheid movement, which I think is becoming a necessity? And here I don't want to go into legal definitions, by the way. I think the situation for the Palestinians in Israel is probably less than uh, blatant apartheid, in some aspect it is in terms of land, planning, housing, scare resources, it's more like apartheid. In terms of political rights, probably it's not. But in the West Bank, is it's, it's becoming worse than apartheid. In the apartheid, you didn't see F-15 going over bombing blacks. We witnessed that in Israel. So Israel, whenever it wants, we are part of Israel. And at the second moment, we are just the other, the enemy in a war. And they can bombard us with F-15. There is an impasse here. And I want to say five points or six or seven. I'll follow how the time would allow me. Obstacles in establishing an imagination a political consciousness of apartheid and a political movement against apartheid. One is the feeling of a we that was established in South Africa. It came gradually, but at one point, they spoke as South Africans, both on both sides. They spoke about being South Africans. I mean, the limits of the territory at one point somehow stabilized at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. 
Second, apart from the borders that were clear, and in Israel-Palestine, there's something is not clear about which entity we're speaking, the West Bank, the river to the sea. But anyway, there is no, there's nothing that we can say we. The moment you say we and you look around, who's the we? There's something that needs to be established this we. It doesn't come from sky. Second, uh, we have our refugees. The limits of who have the right to politics. There's something that was stabilized in the South Africa, not in terms of borders, but in terms of population. These are the groups that are struggling over the land. We have our own refugees. The Zionists have their potential immigrants. So it's a struggle, not between two communities on the land. The communities on the land, in a way, are representative of a larger communities. There is something at one point, what is apartheid at the end? Apartheid is a category that can exist regardless of settler colonialism. And settler colonialism can exist without the category of apartheid. You can do just ethnic cleansing and you get rid and you don't need apartheid. Apartheid is one constellation when the process of settler colonialism, which is a movement, start to stabilize itself vis-a-vis -vis the local population and creates a regime of, of control. Unity, control, and separation. There is a feeling that there is something about the Big Bang of 1948. The dynamics, the movement, it's still there. The Palestinians are still out in this sense. So the, and Israel is still grabbing more and more and more and more land. We are approaching the moment of stabilizing the project and institutionalizing as a process of supremacy, as a, a regime of, of total domination and uh, control. Now, there's something about defeat, which is important in history. You have to be defeated intellectually on certain fronts in order to be focused on something. I think Israel is right wing and probably not right wing, is still fantasizing about slowly evacuating Palestine. Slow deportation, slowly, slowly, but steadily. Our existence is not taken for granted. For apartheid, you have really to recognize as a Jew that this is final. We are stuck with them. And I think some Palestinians, the existence of the Jews is not completely taken for granted. The, let's say the event of the Nakba is still so fresh. We have witnesses who witnessed the Nakba. So overcoming the Nakba always can become a sort of excess. Justice, there is always the risk of excess. I'm, I sound very pessimistic in the sense sometimes times need to pass and we have to be stuck with each other in one unity and knowing that there's no escape. This is one unity. Now I'll move to other sort of uh, political imagination that hinders the... We are still asking for separation. We Palestinians, we still think as, as Virginia has explained in terms of self-determination. Self there's something in the apartheid that presumes a certain unity and there's a separation within unity, subjugation, and you want to end this subjugation by a, within a unitary state of full equal rights. So the PA actually, and much of the Palestinian elite, we want separation. We want the green line. We want to be separated. We don't want to think in terms of unitary regime. We don't uh, uh, mandatory Palestine. Because some actually think that if you give up on the um, green line, you would be absorbed into Israel 
and you wouldn't have any way, any possibility to achieve any equality, and you will be uh, losing the possibility for self-determination and you losing the fight for equal rights. So to move to one state solution, and the one state solution is the negation of apartheid in, in, in many ways, there, there's a relation between the imagination of apartheid and one state uh, relation. They, they feed into each other actually. And, and one of my arguments uh, was that actually the one state solution as a solution it allows you to see the reality now of apartheid. So the solution sometimes precede the problem. You see things through the lenses of the future and you look at the current reality. But we Palestinians, we want separation. We are thirsty for a flag, embassies. We want our own police. We like to hit each other in the street to practice our sovereignty. It's still a dream. And there are hundreds of thousands of people invested in this project. Now, this has been also in South Africa. I, I, I mean, it, it, this thing has a history the ban, in, in the ban to stand. But I'm not sure if it was in, entrenched as much in South Africa as in Palestine. And in the second point in this regard is the international law, this entrenchment of the imagination of separation the centrifugal power that pushes the two sides apart in the history of the 242 and other international documents that separate us. In order to have a one state solution uh, or binational state, you have at the same time this centripetal and centrifugal powers. We have too much centrifugal powers. It's so difficult to create the sense of we. And here the history of international law in this regard, it might sound like an obstacle. I don't see any of those, it's not, couldn't be overcome, but I'm just telling the story of where we are stuck now in, in, this, in this regard. The next point, political theology. We are here in the panel the four of us, we, we think as seculars, but not all people are secular nationalist or secular liberal. We can't overlook this fact. I mean, both Zionism have a very crucial turn into uh, political, theological, right-wing missionism. And so the PLO liberation movement has a, such a um, uh, turn as well. This is weakens liberal discourse. And we are two major religions facing each other as well. I mean, there's also mapping of national on religious and on settler and colonial. Th three mappings that create certain strong dichotomy. There was something in South Africa in the, the missionism of uh, Christianity that many of the leaders actually uh, of the black community, including Mandela himself, um, um, that, uh, or Tutu. Can you imagine anti-apartheid without Desmond Tutu? That create a certain common horizon for the discourse. We still lack that. We lack certain common vocabulary. The next point is the total dependence of blacks, uh, of whites on, on, the, on the cheap labor of blacks. This is a created dependency. So the togetherness was also in the, in the, in the working place, in the economy. So there was a, the economy was bringing the two communities together, but racism was bringing them apart. And th that was the created apartheid, is the pressure toward the togetherness and the ideological pressure to separate. That created the need for violence, enforcement through the force of law to separate. We still lack that on, uh, in Palestine. And probably here, 
really Israel is learning from South Africa in, in terms of non-dependence on Palestinian labor. They, they started to import labor uh, from the outside. I want to stop here, I can go on. Anybody who wants to think about anti-apartheid movement, because anti-apartheid movement at the end would have to think, oh, we're gonna live in one state as equals, the oneness, the common frame, the sense of the we, I don't see this is easily could be done. It could be done, but not easily. And I just wanted to mention some obstacles that hinder the imagination that we are stuck together and we have to imagine a future together. I'll stop here. I think I gave you enough reason to be, to for despair that I don't think you need any other dose from me. I, I don't think it's a, uh, it's a cause for despair. I think it's I actually a call, call to action. Uh, and um, I think we have lots of questions. Thanks, uh, Raif. But uh, we have lots of questions and I'm gonna try and get to as many of them as we can. And some of them are coming in on the chat and some are coming in through Facebook. So there was one question early on, I'm not sure um, if uh, who, who would like to take this on, but um, one questioner asks, can speakers comment on the use of apartheid state versus apartheid regime? I believe that an apartheid regime implies the regime can change while the state can exist with a different regime. While apartheid state implies that the state ent is entirely consumed in the definition of apartheid and the only way for apartheid to end is for the state to cease all, uh, to exist altogether. Um, does anyone want to talk? Uh, Ilan, you talked about the importance of language. In fact, both Ilan and Raif did, but um, you were talking about the importance of the sort of bottom-up definition uh, of apartheid. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on the issue of the regime versus the state. Well, I, I think that, uh, I think it's very important to, to talk about a regime rather than a state when it comes to translating uh, this discussion into an operative uh, strategy uh, for the future. Um, otherwise, you are entangled in, to my mind, in not a very constructive uh, uh, discussion, such as does the state of Israel has the right to exist, uh, the elimination of the state of Israel, uh, which is popular in some circles and, and seem to be the uh, a kind of a solution that people uh, believe in. But I think that uh, a new dictionary that includes the a regime change is a legitimate term when it comes to uh, describe what preconditions are needed in order to change the reality in Palestine is very useful. Now I know that regime change can be both positive and negative uh, in uh, the short collective memory of everyone who lives in the Middle East when it comes to the Arab Spring, uh, a fall of regime could be seen as a very positive thing morally. Uh, but when it comes to the invasion of Iraq, a regime change can be seen as an imperialist aggressive move by the United States. Uh, but I think in the case of, of, of Israel, uh, when we talk about apartheid regime, we are contributing to undermining a, a, a language and a discourse uh, which was very harmful, despite the fact that it, was, it consists of very benevolent terms such as a peace process, a resolution of a conflict, a settlement, and, and or the, even the end of occupation. I think that if we replace peace with decolonization, or with the end of, of uh, or, or with a regime change, uh, uh, I think that we are at least language-wise uh, speaking in a language which is, which is relevant to the reality on the ground. While for 50 years, those who were either cynically or genuinely involved in peacemaking in Israel and Palestine were using a language uh, that sounded very positive and even uh, progressive but actually provided immunity uh, and a shield to Israel uh, to continue its criminal policies uh, on the ground. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, that's helpful. Um, 
I think one of the lessons that's emerging from this uh, conversation is, is the importance of language and the importance of changing the lexicon when, when it comes to talking about um, Israel and, and Palestine. Um, there's another question uh, that came in about, um, about the, the, well, I guess the means of regime change. Compared to South Africa by the end of the 1980s, Israel is much stronger, has closer economic ties to India and China and has a strong base of support in the USA. If Israel were to lose a big chunk of foreign subsidies due to pressure by the citizenry of other countries, wouldn't the state still be in a much better position to keep its oppressive system afloat? Would domestic striking by Palestinians in the West Bank and inside the Green Line be a more efficient strategy to break the system? Uh, I don't know if, if you want to take that on. Um, um, I really am not expert on South on South Africa um, at all. I mean, I I had one visit, so I don't know how compared in terms of economics and uh, Israel compared to South Africa. But clearly, Israel is a strong state, um, not only military, uh, not only economically, uh, but it's probably. And this is something the Palestinians should really break their heads thinking about. Um, Israel is also morally, there has been no such a settler colonial project that has such a um, moral support in the international community for such a long time. And we know the reasons why. I mean, uh, it's clear uh, some of those settlers were refugees. The European busy to see them as refugees and we see them as soldiers and settlers. But the Europeans are obsessed with their image as fleeting uh, from the Nazi Germany. And this is really puts on the Palestinian an extra effort. It's not you're, you're the underdog in terms of military and economy, you're approaching this struggle uh, as well. What's this? Uh, can you see me now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, um, I have something on my screen that. Um, no, don't, don't worry. We look at the definition of the IHRA. Now we are the racist and we're. Uh, so I think this struggle is 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 really, really difficult in this regard. And the Palestinian, speaking of power, uh, really facing a huge, huge, powerful uh, um, uh, Israel. Now, the other thing that one should take into account these days is that Israel gained such an economic power in the last 10 years where the, all of the Arab world actually, uh, following the Arab Spring and the revolution is in, a, in, in, in such a dire situation. So um, many Palestinians, at least in Israel, they don't see anything pressing now at this moment in time to uh, initiate a new historical struggle against apartheid regime. There's something about the a difference between what's going on in Israel in terms of economic uh, prosperity in the last 10 years, really, uh, compared to the, uh, to the Arab world. So the, the problem is speaking about Palestinians in the West Bank and Palestinians in Israel, is the very well-known problem of collective coordinated action or in game theory, the prisoner's dilemma. Because, uh, and this is a situation where all settler colonials use. You create a stratification, different categories of the natives, of the local. Some have more than others. And then those who are in the middle, they are always in the situation whether to join the struggle of those who are in the worst situation but then you are at the risk that you might actually worsen your situation. And I think Israel is playing on that. I don't see now any clear political strategy how to face this prisoner's dilemma. And if there's something that someone that wants to do smart 
Palestinian politics needs really to think of how you create collective coordinated action that can allow the Palestinians at the same time to struggle together, to struggle together, to push the struggle together without putting too much pressure on those in the middle because Israel have Palestinians in Israel, then you have Palestinian in East Jerusalem, then you have Palestinians in area A, area C, and you have Gaza. Fragmented the whole Palestinian scene and each has his own interest. Now, to come and to preach, we are all Palestinians, we have the same interest and lists revolt on the 5th of January, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. You need to develop the strategy of collective coordinated action. How to do that, it's a long story. Okay, um, there's a question for uh, Professor Tilly. Don't you think that for South Africa, the international community was able and willing to unify against apartheid? While in the case of Palestine, Israel, the leaders of the international decisions, US and Europe have never wanted to materialize a Palestinian state. Thus, we remain in a protracted conflict management rather than trying to find or impose a solution. Maybe this ties in with your critique of the sort of America first idea and what the alternative to that is. And I think in some of your remarks, you, you might have suggested that maybe something like a PA first, maybe take control of the PA, dissolve it, and then you know, make, turn that into a springboard for action. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, well, this is so, you know, the theorists always get nervous when they're pinned to the wall about real life issues. So I, I, I fully uh, appreciate Rife's uh, observations on this too. Um, I don't think a P, I don't think a PA first uh, approach would work. Or just to start off with, I mean PA is obviously um, playing a certain role here. Uh, they all of their eggs are in this basket. Um, their their money, their prestige, their cronyism, their patronage networks, their their influence, their diplomatic standing on the international stage. This is all tied up with the Palestinian Bantustan state. I, I do think Reif is overgeneralizing a bit when he says nobody's talking about this because obviously people are talking about this. The, the apartheid question is now percolating all over the place and a lot of people have, have been, I mean, I've, I've been asked to speak on it a lot, which I think is a signal that people are concerned and trying to figure it out. Uh, the, it's given a lot more teeth to anti-apartheid week I think, uh, which it, at first was just a suggestive thing. I think, I think it's growing there. And what I'm trying to suggest is that the, the reimagining project that is at the center of my attention right now and that Raif has talked about um, is the place to do this work. Uh, it's obviously required. Um, there's been a lot of uh, what the old jargon would have called false consciousness going on. You know, the false consciousness that Palestinian citizens of Israel will ever be equal members of the state or the, the false consciousness that Israel will ever withdraw from the West Bank and that it can there then form the heartland of a new Palestinian state or the, you know, the, you know, false consciousness that refugees, you know, are, will someday come back to homes that they, you know, they deserve and have every legal right to through a two state solution. I mean, that, that's in, uh, contradictory on its face. Um, I, I think the work, and, and here I, I do want to come back and, and give credit to eggheads like myself, um, although I'm very peripheral in this one. I mean, you know, as Herzl famously put it, if you will it, it is no dream, right? You know, I mean, it, it, the intellectuals have a tremendous role in, in, in early moments like this. We're rapidly sidelined by the politicals, you know, the, the political leaderships and the movements, but the imagining part, the, the making sense of things, the, the initial formulations. I think there is a, is historically, we look comparatively around the world, we find a very crucial role for, um, you know, people like Ilan and, and the people that uh, Ilan brings to his center. And um, the, that's where the work needs to happen. And I agree with Raif that a lot of this concerns consciousness, perception, 
um, a kind of strategic rethinking of pessimism. I, I think that the Israelis have very skillfully wedged Palestinians into the present situation where they do they are fragmented. That's the point. That's the apartheid regime. Um, they've been very good at that. And that hasn't been, uh, I think on some vague level, everybody knew that was happening, but it wasn't articulated as political programs. Um, and that needs to happen. I do have more optimism though, cautiously. I, I think this is the only optimism on the table, but I actually think it's a robust optimism that if the, it, once the Palestinians start to say, we don't want a Bantustan state, we're not gonna settle for a Bantustan state and we see we're gonna get one, we reject that. We need another paradigm. We need to understand Israel, it's not a metaphor for, you know, it isn't a metaphorically apartheid state, it is an apartheid state, apartheid regime. We reject that, grapple with the settler colonial dilemma of, forming a state with a giant, you know, 50, effectively in this case, 50, 50 settler indigenous population. Once you do that, you inherit all these international human rights norms, all the great conventions come to bear, all the moral authority of the South, South African struggle comes to bear. Um, the, the Palestinians would instantly inherit a really powerful set of ideas. Um, I, I think the PA is doomed because it can't get more than a Bantustan state. And as this becomes more clear, there will always be people depending on the PA and following the PA and linked to the PA because that's the way it's been set up. But the majority of Palestinians, I think, see through that. And um, I'm thinking back to the first intifada. I mean, that was, uh, you know, unity, unanimous mobilization in the OPT. There's deep fissures between inside 48 and outside 48. And those have been sculpted by Palestinians for survival reasons, as well as crucially by Israel. Um, that's work. That's work that needs to happen on the ground in the movement to rethink these ideas. Uh, I think there's a big role for workshops. I think there's a big role for conferences, uh, events like this, testing this, putting this forward, comparing, the, trying to draw lessons from the South African experience where, where those are relevant. But I think it is the ticket out of this. It's the only ticket out of this. Uh, otherwise you're gonna have a, you know, Indian reservation. Um, and that's not a stable solution. I don't think that's tolerable. I, I'm not sure I answered the question specifically, but I hope that that was somehow relevant to it. No, I, I think uh, that addresses it. Um, uh, there's a question for uh, Raif about why Palestinian citizens of Israel don't speak about apartheid, uh, why they don't think in terms of racial discrimination. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, no, I, what I... Uh when I said, and this is probably referring back to Virginia, I mean, if one goes to, we're having an election now. If one goes to the programs of the parties, to their who's, who's we in this context? That... <laughs> so I mean, there are two, there are two elections. No, I'm, I'm just asking who's the we, since you talked about there is no we. Uh, no, I'm speaking, if anybody would go and check the um, uh, political programs of the parties, of their platforms, of their videos they're circulating, of their propaganda, etc., etc., you wouldn't see the word apartheid. I, I was very specific. Um, so uh, I'm not speaking about uh, certain intellectuals here and there, university professors, we're having this conversation. Uh, th there you might see, but I'm speaking about the way the political uh, uh, parties, political scene is acting, is not acting. Uh, in the recent years, um, there is something that stabilizes the green line, I think. Uh, in the political imagination of the Palestinians in Israel. Because there, there's, uh, though Israel is 
eroding the green line in many ways by more settlements, more uh, roads. There are, now we have a university, hospitals in the West Bank. Um, but I have a recent poll uh, that tries to examine what matters for uh, Palestinians in Israel. What is on their agenda? Uh, the Palestinian question is not very high on their agenda. Not the first, not the second, not the third, not the fifth. It's probably the sixth issue on their uh, agenda. Uh, look at the region. I mean, th there is something uh, going on in, in the region in this regard. Now, uh, but one thing I learned from speaking to people in South Africa that I am not impressed by this iceberg because many times the, the crisis come when it looks that the all the currents is going one way and then things just, so tomorrow might be um, outbreak of a new intifada and something would all of a sudden come out uh, to the surface. So the fact that in the recent years, Israel managed, let's say, to domesticate the expectations of Palestinians in Israel. I don't think that this is gonna last forever. Uh, I mean, just one thing and might change uh, the, 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 the direction. Uh, so that's why I think they're not speaking uh, about uh, apartheid in general. Um, it's, it's, it's the political parties that I was talking about, the political scene, uh, basically. Okay, I think we have time for one one more question quickly. Um, uh, what do the panel members think about the confederation idea, two states with one economy and freedom of movement in joint capital? Isn't that the most feasible and just horizon? Uh, I don't know, Ilan, if you want to take that, the yeah. confederation. Yes, I, I, I'm afraid that this is still... Uh... Uh, a, a different version of the two-state solution, uh, which is an obsolete idea and is not working anymore. Uh, in fact, I think that uh, I'm, I'm more optimistic than Rife because I think he disregards the fact that we were all mesmerized in the, until 2005, 2006 by the two-state solution, by the Pax Americana, by the way we looked at the reality I'm not talking about everyone in this panel, but I'm talking about uh, Palestinian polity, world polity, and so on. We wasted 50 years, uh, as the Jewish joke goes, looking for a key where there was light and not where we lost it. And now we know where we lost the key, which, is mean, which means we need to decolonize the whole of historical Palestine, find a way of allowing the refugees to return. And yes, this is a huge mountain to climb. I, there's no doubt about it. And one of the reasons there's a huge mountain to climb is because we, we were climbing a small hill, which was called the two-state solution. Uh, and when we reached the top, we saw that uh, we didn't do much uh, in our life. Uh, therefore, I think uh, it will take time, but I, 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 have, I have very little doubt that eventually the Palestinian national movement itself uh, would accept uh, uh, that apartheid Israel is the reality that they have to oppose all over uh, 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 historical Palestine, from the Mediterranean to the sea, which would require a, a certain definition of what liberation means in the 21st century. What does decolonization mean in the 21st century? There is very little work on it on the Palestinian political side. There's a lot of work on the academic side. Uh, and, and these two uh, projects, the academic one and the political one, have to fuse together in order to uh, face the reality, especially the one that unfolded since 2000, where there is a clear Israeli unilateral policy uh, that already matured uh, into uh, one apartheid republic state from the river to, to, the, to the sea. Uh, and therefore, any solution that does not see as its goal in changing that uh, apartheid reality through the dismantling of the colonialist institutions, uh, it, the legal system, 
the very basic ethos of, of a settler colonial country, uh, of course, has very little chance of changing the reality. I'm not saying that, as I say, we are on the slope of that mountain, but we are beginning to climb the right mountain, finally. And the last thing I would like to say is, we have to remember that Palestinian society is the youngest in the world. 50% of the Palestinians are under 18. If you take the whole, all the communities, including the refugees and so on. It's very interesting to look at the, the, the world of these young people. They don't speak in conferences. They don't speak in webinars. They speak between themselves in the internet, in a different kind of, uh, on different kinds of platforms. And they have the, the, the same idealism uh, that defeated the Arab uh, Spring in many ways. A, a detest for, for organization, uh, for uh, movements, and so on, and one has to find a way of uh, uh, regaining the confidence in the need of organization in order to push forward ideas. But the ideas are there, and uh, uh, and, and I think there's a unify there's some unifying ideas there uh, among these uh, uh, young people uh, that eventually have a chance. I'm not saying I'm not a prophet. Have a chance of being uh, translated into a political movement. And I would be very doubtful if in 15, 20 years, these young people would come out with a kind of a real political plan based on two states or federation. I think they will go for the whole uh, deal uh, as part of, uh, of their vision for the future. Very much, I think, like Virginia uh, described it. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of a movement which is called the Initiative for the One Democratic State. We're trying to disseminate in uh, the discourse on it. We're not a political movement that uh, goes for elections and so on. And especially among young people, we see a, a very favorable response to the need for Palestinians, first and foremost, to articulate the, the, the meaning of decolonization in the 21st century through a clear political program for the future through democratic institution an authentic democratic institution, and maybe ones that, like the ANC, should include eventually also progressive uh, Jews in them, so that the ANC model could be adopted uh, for a new kind of model of the PLO. Uh, these are long-term projects. Anyone who thinks that they are there for us to be implemented tomorrow is wrong, but it's very good to have a vision for a future uh, that doesn't only look at desperately on what hasn't gone right, but actually looks forward on what can still be done despite the very dismal reality on the ground. I have no argument with anyone who would describe the reality as, as uh, uh, disastrous uh, and horrendous. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm not leaving, I'm, but I, I have a feeling it's no, my no. last chance to speak. No, so I think- I'm saying this, goodbye, this. <laughs> but I'm staying, yeah. I'm staying. <laughs> now we are going to ha have to wrap it up there. Uh, no, I think this this is all really useful because uh, also speaking as uh, representing the Institute for Palestine Studies here and, and ARDI, our partner organization, I think it provides a way of thinking about the role of such institutions in reimagining and developing a new political vocabulary in trying to frame the the terms of the debate differently. And, and of course, with as Ilan is, and, and, and Raif and Virginia all stressed, with a great deal of input sort of from the bottom up. I mean, as, as you all mentioned, Israeli Apartheid Week was very much a student and activist driven movement and put the, the whole notion of apartheid very much back on the table. So this is all very useful and actually gives us um, at IPS and RD and, and similar organizations, a kind of an agenda uh, to work with. So thank you very much uh, for, for the discussion.